First of all, um, I would like to thank the organizer uh, for inviting me. And uh, so this is really uh, special for me. This is the first time I attend the Royal Statistical Society meeting. And uh, so it's such a great honor to be here. And in particular, I got a very, very special welcome <laughs> from the uh, YSS, from the students and uh, last night, and uh, so especially through the Twitter. And uh, so I would like to thank them. And, uh, and also I hope this talk can inspire our young students to help us more with the field. And so let me start. And uh, so we are really living in an exciting time with the massive um, genome exposome and phenome data. A good example of the genome is the whole genome sequencing. I will say a few words about that. A good example of the exposome is uh, the smartphone technology. For example, smartphone technology can measure the spatial and temporal uh, exposures and, uh, of air pollution. And uh, also a good example of a phenome uh, is the electronic medical record. And uh, so the goal is to study the interplay of the genes and the environment and to see how they impact the phenotype as statistician called the outcome or diseases. And so a very good example of data, including these three type of data, is the bio bank. Bio banks are the trend of the health science field, and UK in particular pioneered in this area. And uh, so the bio bank include the um, genome data, EMR data, epidemiological data, imaging data, and wearable devices. Almost every single institution and is building its own bio bank, and uh, many, many countries and, uh, are building their national bio banks. And uh, so the UK bio bank, I will say a few words, contains a, five, a half million people, and uh, so many other bio banks are rapidly available, and many of them include the large national bio banks, such as the China Kaduri bio bank and the Finland bio bank, that is a half million, contains 10% of Finland population, and also million by program and uh, the Geisinger, which is a health care system and, uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, link the health care system with uh, uh, genomics data. And the other one is the eMERGE, which is a consortium of electronic medical record in the U.S. So with those different biobanks combined, there are millions of people with uh, the different type of data. And uh, a good, another good example is all of us. It used to be called the Precision Medicine Program in U.S. It contains about half a million people. And uh, so the bio bank looked like this. And uh, um, there's no pointer here. And so look like they can see this is very much like a warehouse, and, but everything is digitalized. The one can pick up instrument, um, specimen sample and uh, basically by robot. And so the goal of this is uh, to promote the precision health, which includes both the precision medicine and also precision prevention. And so let me say a few words about UK Biobank. And so UK has really pioneered in this field and make the UK Biobank data public available. And so since the UK Biobank data became public available one year ago, over 400 papers has already been published. And the UK Bio Bank has a half million people, and right now has a GWAS data available. It contains about 800,000 SNPs, and this is based on array technology, and also has electronic medical record linked with those um, GWAS data. And it has four, over 4,000 phenotypes, including the demographic information, and the lab test result, and the diseases, and the phenotype using IC10 code, and the U.S. still using IC9 right now, and also has a plan to have the imaging data available for 100,000 people. Right now, has about 5,000 people with the imaging data available, and also have 100,000 people with um, activity monitors, like wearable devices. And so, UK Biobank just started a a whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing effort in partner with the MRC. MRC invests the 30 million pound and also partner with eight biopharm company. So the hope is to have the whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing data available to the research community in a few years. So with those massive data, such as UK Biobank data, so the 
generating data is not a problem. So we as a statistician have to think about how we position ourselves and uh, in on the big data arrow. So um, over the years, in the last few years, and there are uh, worries and, uh, in our community that uh, st statistics may be marginalized by data science. And so how can we think about we should position ourselves and uh, still become a quantitative leader in this field? So just take one step back and what is, uh, think about the starting point, think about our history. And uh, so, for example, in both statistics and uh, statistician plays such a central role in clinical trials. And uh, so how, could, uh, how did that happen? It's difficult to think about any clinical trial without a bowel statistician. So, so a very good starting point for me is how can we position ourselves to solve big science, scientific problems. And uh, so right now, data generation is not a problem. And the value of the data is not the data itself, it's analysis. So how can we transform the data into knowledge? And uh, so what is our niche as a statistician? So I would say the skill-based statistical inference. And uh, so how can we promote skill-based statistical inference and driven by uh, solving big scientific problems? And uh, historically, and uh, we have very, very good uh, partnership and uh, with domain scientists, like uh, in the clinical trial setting uh, with uh, MDs. And so they have not been only our partners, but also they have been our strong advocates. And uh, so now with those massive data, there's a third pillar of data science, that is the uh, informa uh, informatics and uh, computer science. Then we, it was important for us to think about how can we develop a partnership and, uh, uh, with the uh, informatician and the computer scientists and also how they can be our advocates, just like MDs who are advocates for statistician in clinical trials. And uh, so these three pillars are equally important when we advance on data science. So I, in this talk, I would like to make uh, four points, and uh, then I will use uh, four different uh, case study to illustrate those four points. The very first point is to solve the um, big problems using big data. So it's, we need to empower statistical inference and by integrating domain science and also uh, computational science. So when I was a student and uh, I was told that it's really important for us to collaborate with a domain scientist. And uh, now I think I would say, uh, and this is what I tell my students and post as well. Now I would say it's also important for us to become scientists. This is one step ahead. And in order to be a leader in this field, so let me use a whole genome sequencing study as a case study to illustrate the point. And uh, so for the whole, uh, each human genome has about three billion base pair ACTG across the genome, the, the letters. And uh, then, um, so with the success of the GWAS, why do we care about the whole genome sequencing? The reason is GWAS is a uh, array technology. It only covers the common variants. And uh, so the, uh, the GWAS arrow was be in the last 10 years. And uh, so many use the array technology. For example, in this two example, if you look at the uh, green loci, and so you can see that there are seven people, three cases, and four controls. And so for this three loci, there are four Ts and three Cs. So this variance is common enough in the population. It's covered by the GWAS. However, if you look at this uh, blue low side, and uh, so you can see there is only like uh, there's only one A, all the rest of G. So the variance is too rare; it's not covered by the GWAS. So the uh, whole genome sequencing basically cover every single base pair across the genome, and uh, so cover both the common variants and also cover the rare variants. So. With uh, whole genome sequencing technology, right now it's about uh, $1,400 sequencing the whole genome per person. And uh, so GWAS common variants only occupy less than 10% of the genome, and more than 90% genome are the rare variants. And why we care about the rare variants? The reason is they are more likely to be functional, they are causing the human diseases, and also they are, the coded protein are more likely to be the drug target. So here is the whole genome sequencing um, timeline. 
So it's about 10 years ago, that was launch of 1,000 genome project. Only 1,000 people were sequenced at very low depths. It's only 4x. And now, and with advanced technology, we can sequence the genome as a deeper depth and also with much, much less cost. And about three years ago, last was a launch of the top mat, that is by the NHLBI, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So the plan is to do whole genome sequencing of 150,000 people. And about two years ago, that was a launch of the genome sequencing program by the National Human Genome Research Institute in US. The plan is to do whole genome sequencing of 200,000 people. And these two program combined right now is the larger the sequencing, whole genome sequencing program in the world. But with the bio banks, and uh, the, more, uh, the more and more people will be sequenced. So here's the current status of the GSP and TopMed. And uh, so TopMed is called this Transomic Position Medicine Program, and so has over 70 projects, and has already finished about 120,000 um, uh, whole genome sequencing, and uh, also generated over 100, 500 million genetic variants. And uh, so the GSP, the genome sequencing program, is currently in year two and uh, has finished about 100,000 uh, uh, whole genome sequencing so far. And uh, so it um, has a three analysis center, including one of us, and uh, so the Harvard Analysis Center. And uh, so it's important for the statistician to be involved in the, uh, this high, uh, uh, high profile uh, study to help build the community standard for the data uh, analysis and also the pipelines. To give you a sense about the, how the data look like, so 10 years ago when the microarray data came out and we talk about the small and large P problem and with couple dozen subjects, like 20,000 genes. And 10 years later, the problem we deal with is the large N, so like in the uh, GSP setting uh, project and is a 20, 200,000 people and a huge P problem. And uh, so this, uh, uh, like in the top mat, for example, like for freeze uh, five, we have 500 million variants. And uh, then also the other uh, thing we deal with a very sparse design matrix. So I'll show you how the data look like. So this is a top, uh, top mat freeze five data has 54 thousand genome, whole genome sequencing, and totally has 450 million variants. So if you look at the design matrix, it's 54,000 rows and 450 million columns. And among them, 200 million are singleton. That means only one person has that particular variance, nobody else. That basically is a private variance, and that makes lots of sense because that's why we are all different. About 70 million are doubletons. Only two people have it. Only Daniel and I have, and nobody else have. And uh, so, and only about uh, 12 million are common variants. That is on the GWAS chip. So if you look at the design matrix, statistician work a lot with the dense de design matrix, but in this type of study, we have to deal with very sparse design matrix. So for each row is a subject, each column is the uh, SNP. So if the bright dot indicate one, black dot indicate zero. So you can see in each column, there are lots of lots of zero, only very small number of ones. So the design matrix are very, very sparse. So many statistical theory we developed for um, uh, handling high dimensional data assume dense design matrix, it won't work in this type of setting. So, so to, to deal with this type of problem, really get involved in the community. So we have to learn the, um, the language, and we have to learn the data format the community deal with. And for the whole genome sequencing studies, and because the data are humongous, and so we have to learn how to work effectively with different uh, type of data format, and uh, then also generate the data format that is capable for the uh, scalable analysis. So for the whole genome sequencing data, the BAM file generally are imaging file. That's really, really big. And so even we convert the BAM files, and the only sequencing center keep the BAM files. And even convert the BAM file to the VCF files, that's still really big. So for example, for top mat freeze five data with 54,000 people, the VCF file is 120 terabytes. And so this kind of data is hard to read into SAS. SAS just, uh, and 
also hard to read into R. So basically, R cannot handle it. So we have to think about smart way to convert the data in a way that is much, much smaller and compressed, but keep the same information and we can read into R and also uh, into the R sparse matrix and do the analysis. One type of data format is called the GDS file that generally is used for gaming and that can be used here and to do the substantial compression. So you can see the, sub, uh, the compression rate is about 0.1% compared to the, uh, 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 the VCF file is only about uh, 143 gigabytes. It's much, much smaller. So we can read into R and then read into R sparse matrix and then help with the analysis. So with those massive data compared to before, and it's more important to understand the purpose of analysis and then develop methodology and uh, addressing the goal of the analysis. And uh, so, therefore, it's more important to understand the science and in order for our method and to be used in the field. And so the first goal of the whole genome sequencing analysis is a signal detection. So the idea is how can we scan the genome with those 500, 440 million virus across the genome to identify the genetic regions and that are associated with the human diseases, for example, like cardiovascular disease. And uh, so compared to the GWA study, because it only covers a common variants, and the uh, whole genome sequencing study covers the real variants, the design matrix is really, really sparse. And uh, so in the GWAS, one analyzes a SNP, one SNP at a time. So basically do marginal analysis, and then apply the Bonferroni correction, and then validate the result using independent study. This doesn't work and uh, for a whole genome sequencing study. The reason is variants are too rare. So for example, for a single attempt, and uh, we cannot even, if the design matrix has, each column has only one one, all the rest are zero, I cannot even fit the logistic regression. So this doesn't work. So we have to really borrow information. And so basically we we'll have to perform SNP set analysis. Then how can we define the SNP set? That is how we have to learn the domain, domain knowledge. And so in this particular example, I illustrate that we can analyze the promoters of this particular gene. And promoter generally had multiple variants. For each region, for each gene, it has a promoter. And uh, so this is a regulatory region and has multiple variants. So think about for this particular gene, it has 100 variants. Because many, many of those variants are real variants, I cannot run um, what statistics, and I can even not fit the model. And so estimation is very, very difficult. And also for any particular region, only a small number of variants are causal variants. For this, for this toy example, you can see there are four beta not equal to zero. And so ideally, what I want to do is, for these 100 variants, I have to analyze them together. Ideally, I want to do is, I do four degree freedom tests, pick up those four and do four degree freedom tests. But I don't know there are four beta not equal to zero. I don't know where they are. So what can we do? I don't want to do 100 degree freedom test, right? So what can I do? And also I need to scan the genome very quickly. So this will basically come up with the inference problem. So how can we deal with a high dimensional inference problem? And in any particular genetic region, like a promoter, I have uh, uh, hundreds or maybe uh, or the, uh, uh, in intron or the extron of a gene, I can have hundreds or thousands of the variants. And then how can I do this high dimensional testing problem? So this will deal with the, either the alternative is a dense alternative or sparse alternative. If the alternative is a dense alternative, that means that there are sufficient number of uh, betas not equal to zero. And so in this setting, we could do this kind of SCAD procedure we developed about eight years, uh, seven years ago. This has been widely used uh, in the uh, uh, in the whole genome sequencing commu community. And the other way is if the alternative is a sparse, and uh, then what can we do? Ideally, suppose there are only two signals, and among these 100 variants, ideally I want to do two degree freedom tests, but I cannot because I don't know there are two, I don't know where they are. And so therefore, this kind of idea originally from Tukey and called the higher criticism idea could be useful. And so we generalize this, we call the generalized higher criticism or generalized Burke-Jones to handle this kind of sparse alternative setting. 
So how this look like? And so basically, if suppose for each variance, we have a marginal Z statistic. So how can we aggregate this 100, they have 100 variants, I want to aggregate this 100 variants to do association analysis. And one way is I sum over this marginal Z statistic, square it, and put down some weight. I'll explain what the weights are. And uh, then this statistic is called the scat statistics, and uh, this doesn't follow chi-square 100 degree freedom. The reason is those variants are, are correlated. They follow a mixture of chi-square. And so we have to do this mixture chi-square inference uh, p-value calculation very, very quickly because we have to scan the genome and very quickly. And so everything has to be analytic. We cannot afford bootstrap. We cannot afford, afford permutation. And uh, we need to make the inference scalable. And uh, so this will work out for the dense alternative. But if I have a sparse alternative, suppose I have only two variants and which have beta not equal to zero. Ideally, I want to pick up these two variants and true beta not equal to zero, but I can't. Then what can we do? Then we can threshold the Z statistic, find out the significant SNPs and sum them up. And then the question, for example, suppose I use 1.96 to do the threshold for the Z statistic, I pick up a significant SNPs and sum them up. But the question is, why I use 1.96 to do the threshold, and why not 2.5? And so this come with the idea of a higher criticism. So let's use the data to tell us what is the optimal threshold is, and then count the significant test, then figure out the distribution of this higher criticism. And uh, so we find out what is optimal threshold we should use in order to maximize the power. And also we need to account for the correlation. So all those calculations have to be done analytically very, very quick. And because we need to scan the whole genome and also at a very high precision and a very, uh, to control for multiple comparison. Generally the significant level has to be 10 minus seven or 10 minus eight to reach the genome at significance. And now it's with this weight. So ideally, you can see if I only have two causal variants in this region, I want to put the weight one for these two causal variants, put weight zero for the other 98 chunks. But how can I do that? Because I, in reality, I don't know there are two. So that is why we have to learn the field. We have to learn the biology. And uh, so that is how the whole genome annotation works. So that basically we want to integrate the data from external sources to help us to boost analysis power by incorporating functional information in the weighting. So this is how we do it. We integrate the data from other sources and uh, like the encode and the roadmap, incorporate functional information from other data sources and create a weight. So we create like over 100 annotation, genome annotation for each variant. And then across those 15 different annotation categories like conservation, precision, protein function, epigenetics and so on. And so this requires a lot of knowledge about the field. And uh, so like if you ask me how to pull out those from different data sources, I cannot do it. I'm not trained to do it. And so my way is to hire a bioinformatician, computational biologist in my group. I learned a lot by working with him. So that is how it's important to incorporate domain knowledge. And uh, so, so basically we want to in dynamically incorporate those multi-dimensional weighting in those test statistics and figure out the distribution. And we have to do this analytically very quickly. Does this work? It seems like it helps. When we incorporate the domain knowledge and the biological knowledge through the genome annotation and can help boost uh, uh, the power for scientific discovery. So this is uh, analysis, whole genome sequencing analysis of ARIC data with only 2,000 people. And uh, so the, the phenotype is lipoprotein A. So this SCAT method, so this we did a 4,000 base pair the sliding window across the genome. And uh, so for the SCAT method, that doesn't include annotation. It identified in this chromosome six, identified about 127 and significant regions. And but when we incorporate annotation as a weighting and dynamically, we can identify 150,000, 150, 150 um, significant regions and uh, associated with lipo A. And uh, so this illustrates the importance that we as a statistician, we have to become more like a scientist and we know the domain knowledge and then we know what the important problems are and then incorporate them in the statistical inference so we can solve the bigger problems. 
And also, the inference has to be scalable. When we deal with the genome, and uh, so because the data is so big, we have to scan the whole genome very, very quickly. And uh, so, so this, so therefore, scalable inference is important. Like for the SCAT method, when we use the 100 CPUs, and uh, when we uh, scan uh, 10,000 people, it's only uh, two minutes. If we scan 50,000 people, and only about 0.4 hours. And uh, for the start method, it's 20 minutes for 10,000 people, and then 50,000 people, the whole genome, it's three hours. Remember, this is a, we scan the whole genome, it's almost about 1.5 million analysis we have to do. And uh, so with the cloud computing, and I'll say a few more words later on, and this will even become less computing time. So the second point I want to make is when we deal this with massive data, cultural inference play an important role in solving the big data problem. And uh, association is not the same as a causation. And uh, so many of you probably heard this book and, uh, by Drew Pearls and uh, the book of why. And uh, it's a wonderful book. It was published a couple months ago. And uh, in May, the Atlantic published an article about this book. And uh, so this is a quote from the article. And uh, it, it states the importance of cultural inference in artificial intelligence. It says, uh, artificial intelligence owns a lot of its smarts to true pearls. And in his latest book, The Book of Why, The New Science of Cause and Effect, he argued that artificial intelligence has been handicapped in an incomplete understanding of what intelligence really is. So this speaks for the importance of the cultural inference. And so I will illustrate this importance in the one case study for the using integrative analysis of different type of data. A lot of us are interested in integrative analysis of a lot of data for different types. For example, like genome data, exposome data, and the phenome data. So I will illustrate this integration using the cultural mediation analysis. And so one point um, I feel is important is we should not integrate the data because we want to integrate the data. We integrate the data because we want to have a big scientific problem we want to solve. So this has to be very much driven by scientific problem and scientific question when we think about what we want to integrate and how to integrate in order to address that scientific questions. For different strategies should be used for different scientific questions when we do the integration. So let me do a case study and using this normal native aging study of the, the EWAS. And uh, so this uses the Illumina 450K arrays. And uh, so the exposure is the smoking status and the mediator is the methylation. So this is a 450,000 probe across the genome. And uh, the outcome is a lung function FEV. And uh, so the point I want to make is um, the inference for cultural mediation analysis is quite challenging, and I will show you. And it uh, turns out, and also, most of the time, when we deal with uh, high-dimensional data, high-dimensional data generally is troublemaker. And uh, we have to do the multiple comparison adjustment and uh, so on. And, but in this setting, I'll show you, like a multiple high-dimensional mediator, as a matter of fact, is a blessing and uh, to make this uh, mediation cultural inference feasible. So let's show you how the uh, cultural mediation diagram look like. And uh, so, um, so the E here is the smoking, and the word in the genetic study, it will be the SNP. And uh, the M is the mediator, so in this situation, it's a methylation and of a probe, or the biomarker, like a lipid in cardiovascular disease and setting. And the Y is FEV, and the word, the disease, or the lung function, or the cardiovascular disease. X is a confounder. So in any cultural um, inference framework, and we assume like there's no unmeasured confounding, and the word we can do sensitivity analysis. To do the cultural mediation analysis, the fitting is, as a matter of fact, is quite simple. And so basically we regress the um, FEV and the uh, 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 disease risk probability of cardiovascular disease on the E, the smoking, on the methylation control for the covariates. And uh, so in the cardiovascular disease situation, we uh, regress on the SNP and control for the LDL and the confounders and the mediator with LDL. Then in the long um, example, 
M will be the methylation. We regret the methylation on smoking control for the confounder. And uh, in the um, cardiovascular disease example, M will be LDL, regress on the SNP control for confounder. Okay, now let's think about how to interpret this model. So what is the beta uh, E, that is the coefficient of the smoking? And uh, so this is basically the upper pass, and uh, that measure the e it's called the direct effect. That is the effect of the smoking on FEV, not through the methylation. And uh, so in the cardiovascular example, that will be the effect of the SNP on cardiovascular disease, not through lipid, uh, through LDL. So what is the indirect effect? Uh, this is also called the mediation effect. That is the effect of the, um, that is the effect of the smoking on lung function mediated through methylation. So how do you calculate that? So that basically is a coefficient of uh, beta, that is a coefficient of the association between the smoking and the methylation, uh, uh, sorry, that is between the methylation and the lung function, and then multiply the gamma, that is a coefficient of the smoking and uh, the methylation. And so that makes sense. So therefore, that means the methylation has to be associated with smoking and the methylation has to be associated with the lung function in order for the methylation to be a, a mediator. And uh, so and, uh, in the cardiovascular disease example, then basically the gamma will measure the association between the SNP on the LDL and beta will be the association between LDL and the, on the cardiovascular disease. So this is the product of the two coefficients. And the one point I want to make is how the mediation analysis is related to Mendelian randomization. Many of you probably have heard. And it turns out Mendelian randomization is a special case of the mediation analysis under a strong assumption. That is, there's no direct effect. So that means the effect of, assume the effect of the SNP on cardiovascular disease and uh, only through LDL, not through other biological pathway. So this is assumption of the mediation analysis, uh, of the Mendelian randomization. And uh, so this, um, but also the Mendelian randomization and uh, mediation analysis, they answer different questions. And so basically in Mendelian randomization, it uses the uh, SNP as the instrument and the, to control for the confounding between LDL and the cardiovascular disease. Okay, now let's think about the inference. And uh, so the null hypothesis is there's no mediation effect. So that affects the smoking on lung function is not mediated through the uh, methylation. So I test the beta gamma equal to zero and uh, I do it one probe a time across the genome. Alternative is not equal to zero. If you look at this null hypothesis, it's not common. So the problem we deal with is a composite null problem. Most of the time, we don't deal with a composite null problem. We deal with a simple null problem, right? If you think about the null hypothesis, yes, it has three cases. With a gamma equal to, beta gamma equal to zero, the either gamma not equal to, gamma equal to zero, beta not equal to zero, or gamma not equal to zero, beta equal to zero, or both beta gamma equal to zero. Generally, we don't deal with this type of case. And uh, we both the time we deal with is the simple null, beta gamma equal to zero, alternative is at least one of them not equal to zero, right? And uh, this makes the problem really hard. And uh, so we have to reject all three cases in order to claim mediation effect. And uh, for any probe in the EWAS, and uh, we don't know which case it is. And uh, so how can we deal with this? So let's start from the wall test. And uh, so this basically is also called the Sobo test. So I calculate the beta hat, gamma hat, and divide it by a standard arrow using the Dalton method. Does this follow normal zero one? So if you look the denominator, when the beta gamma equal to zero, what happened to the denominator? Zero. That means Dalton method failed. So under case three, when both gamma beta equal to zero, it doesn't follow normal zero one. It follow normal zero one square. So if as many, many of the probe across the genome, and a matter of fact, the case three, but I don't know which one is the case three. 
And so if you look at this uh, density function, you can see that this green line is the normal zero one, and this sharp black line is normal zero one square. And for, um, for case one or case two, when one beta or one gamma now equal to zero, it is a mixture. It is not a normal zero one either. So basically, for all three cases, the Watt statistic fail. How about the likelihood ratio test? And this is basically the max P test. So basically, what we do is we calculate the p-value and uh, for testing the association between smoking and methylation, and also calculate the p-value between the methylation and the lung function. And then we calculate the maximum of those p-value to ensure that methylation is associated with both. It, maximum likelihood ratio fail as well. It doesn't follow um, chi-square distribution either. So what can we do and in this type of setting? And so, the, um, so if we, so basically when we deal with the composite now, so we need to, uh, idea is we estimate the proportion of the three cases. And uh, this can be calculated in this following way. Then how can I estimate the proportion of the three cases? So that's why this uh, whole genome data, high dimensional whole genome data become a blessing. So I can use the whole genome data to estimate the proportion of the three cases. And after I estimate the pr proportion of those three cases, and basically I use FDR, the uh, proportion of nine nulls in FDR to estimate the three cases, proportions. And then for each case, I calculate the probabilities. And then I combine them and multiply the proportion and the, each case the probability and the p-value and combine those p-value. This is not my p-value. This is my test statistics then I figure out the distribution of this test statistic. I have to do it analytically in order to do, scan the whole genome. Does this work? And uh, so this is analysis uh, is the normal aging study. So the first is a QQ plot you can see using the wall test. Second one using likelihood ratio test. It's definitely very, very conservative. And uh, so because the true dish, many, many of the probe is K3, it follow normal zero, one square. And so you can see not 45 degree line. But if you use this that method, it's beautiful 45 degree line. And that hit AA charging, that is known to be associated with the lung function and also associated with the smoking. So this, uh, this method, uh, this probe, this gene, it play a mediation role of the smoking and the lung function. Okay, the third point I want to make is the reproducible research and the, repli uh, rep uh, and the replicable research. So, it's in, so in the last few, uh, last two years, and there are lots of discussions, of ongoing discussion of the p-values, and it's probably you know the ASA statement about the p-value. So in order to empower reproducible and rep replicable science, it's important for us to go beyond and discussing the p-value. Definitely discussing statistical significance is important, but we have to go beyond that. And uh, so this has to be a joint effort and including multiple pillars and with uh, including the researchers, both the statistician, quantitative scientists, and also domain scientists, and also funding agencies, and also the journals. So I would like to make four points and in this regard. And uh, so the currently there is an ongoing study by National Academy in US on the reproducibility and replicability of science. And uh, so this uh, report, uh, the committee's, uh, committee's um, uh, report will come out um, probably sometime next year. And uh, so as part of the report, and uh, then um, I wrote a commission paper, I was invited by the committee on the reproducibility and the replicability of uh, in large scale genetic studies. And uh, so for this um, a commission paper, and uh, so I, uh, look at uh, what we learn from the history and the lessons we learned from the success of GWAS uh, in reproducibility and replicability. GWAS has been successful in this regard. What can we learn from the history? So the first point is the data reproducibility. And uh, so it's important to build a community standard and uh, for uh, genotyping generation and also QC protocols and also collaborative effort. and. Uh, 
establishing those um, community standard uh, nationally and internationally in the scientific community. So this effort, this uh, one good example is this uh, GA4GH. This is called the Global Alliance for Genomic uh, Health. And uh, so this has been working globally and involving many pillars and uh, trying to build the uh, genomic status. Um, uh, the genetics data, for example, like a GWAS data, uh, data uh, generating um, standard. And so I think we are, uh, the field also need to build the whole genome sequencing data and the QC uh, protocol. This is something we are currently uh, working on. And uh, then also make such standard available to the uh, research community. And for example, in, in the GitHub. And uh, also uh, compared to the uh, genetics data, and phenome data are much, much messier, are much, much more complex. And so they're especially in electronic medical record because SD9, uh, 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 SD9 code is used for billing purpose. It's not for research purpose. And uh, so therefore, the phenotype quality and the standardization and the harmonization is Important work, but very challenging work. If one wants to standardize the phenotype across many electronic medical records, different systems, and different institutions. And uh, uh, so, so the, um, there's uh, recently, there is, uh, last year there was a launch of G2MC. This is a genomic uh, medicine um, uh, um, consortia, and so that involved many um, institutions and also many countries, and to help with this uh, standardization of the phenotyping. And this, um, also, um, the, so as a statistician, and uh, so when I was in graduate school, I learned um, experimental design, but I think not many students now, they take experimental design course, and uh, so they are interested in machine learning and so on. And, uh, 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 so st I would like to re-emphasize the importance of study design, and especially when we do those massive data, a lot of time there's a convenient sampling, so we really have to think hard about the study design and to improve the study design to promote reproducibility and replicabilities. And uh, so, for example, like uh, a good study design will help to handle the batch and effect or center effect when we deal with the, geno uh, the genome data. And for the phenome data, an important part is the selection bias. So when we deal with the massive data, the variance is less a problem because the data are really big. The bias is much more a problem. And so we have to be much more careful in uh, learning the selection bias and, and learn how to handle the selection bias. And uh, so also, and uh, in GWAS, uh, a successful part of GWAS, it built a culture and the norm that for a GWAS study, it need to include both the discovery phase and the independent validation phase. Without the validation, and uh, so it would be difficult for a GWAS discovery to be published in top journals such as Nature Genetics. So we have to develop this kind of community culture and a norm and uh, have both the discovery phase and also validation phase or meta-analysis. And also, um, the, the collaboration through the large international consortia and uh, by, uh, uh, by having a larger sample size. And this will also help with the reproducibility and replicability, and also generally use the stringent criteria and for statistical inference, and for example, adjust for multiple comparisons. So the, generally, the goal is, uh, if I go back here, the goal is really not how can we find the statistical significance, and it's more how can we make statistical inference and the reproducible. And so this speaks for the analysis reproducibility. And so it's important to build and test and, uh, uh, and adopt community standard, and in standard in analysis data, analysis and report, result reporting any particular scientific field. And so such kind of a standard is critically important and uh, to help with the reproducibility. And so those uh, standards have to be tested. And uh, so also the open access software is important, for example, um, implementing those uh, standard analysis. In GWAS, is a plink many, many people use. 
And also, the, this kind of a standard will allow for processing data and perform analysis uh, consistently and transparently. And uh, so without really sharing the data, lots of time because of uh, limitations and uh, difficult to share the original data, but with those everything transparent, this will make the analysis more consistent and transparent. And uh, so, the, uh, so it's important to go beyond the significance and how to find the results more statistically significant. How the, if our goal is to find out the truth of the science, and so it's important to make statistical significance reproducible, not only in the discovery phase, but also in the replication phase. And uh, so the, then the first, and also make the data source and, uh, and also to share, sharing. And uh, so the GWAS data sharing has become a norm in the community. It's due to the NIH mandate and, uh, and also with a strong infrastructure support by DBGAP. And uh, so the analysis findings, the result has been um, uh, built into repositories. And for example, in the GWAS catalog, jointly built by EBI and NCBI. And uh, so therefore, one can search for the findings, and both from the discovery phase findings and also um, validation phase funding in the GWAS catalog and of the uh, uh, significant uh, uh, SNP associated with uh, the uh, disease, different diseases, and also those SNP have been validated. And also the, the report, the, uh, sh the community have become developing a culture now to share the cohort-specific analysis summary statistic, like a Z statistic for every single SNP. And the NIH has really pushed this further by building the NIH data common under the principle called the FAIR principle that stands for findable, accessible, and uh, interoperable and re re reusable. And so this is a cloud environment. Let's speak for the importance of my fourth point of the uh, cloud computing is the trend. So we have to be engaged. And so this is a cl classical cluster computing. And so basically, no sharing of the infrastructure. So I copy the data from the, uh, from the DB gap to my own cluster, then copy the data to his cluster. We don't share the resources, we don't share the data. We copy the data to, the, the, to, the, uh, uh, to our own cluster. And uh, then, uh, so the, uh, cloud computing sharing is basically, data sharing doesn't mean data copy. So we don't want the data copy. So we wanted to bring the traditional model is bring the data to the investigator. The cloud model is the bring the investigator to the data. So put the data in the cloud. Everybody access the same data. And uh, so the example includes Amazon and Google Cloud and NIH is trying to uh, put, uh, make multiple effort on the cloud computing, including the data common and I, uh, Anvil by NIGRI and the stage by NHLBI. And also they are emerging too for help with the data sharing and uh, such as the API or the blockchains and uh, by linking the different data without really bring uh, the data together, basically help with the remote data sharing. And the second one is uh, elastic. So basically, that means if the blue, uh, the yellow investigator need to do more computing and it has more nodes today, tomorrow, the blue investigator need to do more computing at more node tomorrow. And the third part of the cloud computing is the parallel and the distributed computing. This is something we, uh, we, there are lots of research going on for the, both the distributed computing. And uh, so we want to take advantage of that. And uh, so I have found that it's really important to learn science and uh, to learn discovery, um, to learn scientific problem efficiently, but I'm too busy and to read many papers. And uh, so a quick time efficient way to really learn cutting edge scientific problem and discussions and also technology is Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so many cardi cardiologists are on Twitter, and so we should have more statistician on Twitter as well. This is really, a really, really great way to learn science, what's going on in science, and without reading the papers. And you first find out, have the specialist read the paper first and tell you what the interesting problems are, then you go read those important papers. Save me so much time. <laughs> okay, and the final remarks. So we need to cherish the statistical culture, and. Um, and also, this really exciting time and to build a greater statistics. And so we need to continue innovate in both the research and also training. And also, it's, uh, we do work together with our partners and, uh, in, and, and 
computer science, informatics, and also domain science, and uh, be an equal partner in this domain.